All right, Alexander, let's do uh, a video here on an interview with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Actually, uh, media questions uh, given to Vladimir Putin, and they mainly focused on the recent developments in Nagorno Karabakh and the, uh, the peace deal between uh, the ceasefire, peace deal between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I don't know if you can call it a peace deal. Uh, the, I guess better, better to call it a ceasefire and a settlement which has resulted in the Russian military moving into the region. And recent reports that Turkey is also trying to move into the region. Uh, but from what I understand, they will be limited to Azerbaijan territory. But you'll, you'll clear it up. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get into these media questions to Russian President Vladimir Putin. What were your thoughts? Well, first of all, it's extremely unusual format. I mean, this isn't something Putin normally does. I mean, he gives interviews, certainly, but not on a specific uh, uh, topic like this and not in such an intense way. And obviously, these interviews are always conducted in a very, you know, sort of civil way. But... Um, it struck me that Putin was on the defensive much of the time and he was asked some very hard questions specifically and principally and primarily about Russia's relations with Turkey. And we'll come to that in a moment. But on the specific on the specific peace deal, he had some rather interesting things to say. Firstly, he protected, he defended uh, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan of Armenia. He clearly doesn't want to see him uh, removed from power at the moment. I think the reason is that he knows the deal is controversial in Armenia. He's frightened that if Pashinyan goes, the Armenians will try to revisit it. Secondly, he implicitly criticised Armenia. And I'm not talking just about, you know, Pashinyan. I mean, previous Armenian governments for not recognising Nagorno-Karabakh, I think it's called Artish. I apologize if I'm getting the name of this region wrong in Armenian, but he implicitly criticizing them for not recognizing its independence. He said the big difference between Russia uh, in uh, with South Ossetia and Abkhazia and with Crimea was that he simply took the bull by the horns and recognized the independence of these regions. Armenia didn't recognize the region, the independence of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. And the result was that changed the dynamics of this. So he had those things to say. He also, and this is perhaps a, a comment which I think has been over-interpreted, um, criticised Pashinian for not agreeing this peace de deal in the middle of October. He acknowledged that the Russians have been pushing for a settlement of this crisis from way back 2013, very much along these lines that we've seen. In other words, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, the core territory, remains Armenian, but the areas around it that had formed a buffer zone are returned to Azerbaijan. That was the deal that was apparently offered to Pashinyan in mid-October. Uh, Pashinyan turned it down, and as a result, the Armenians have lost the town of Susha which initially, the initial plan, was that they would retain. So that's about the agreement itself, all very interesting and, you know, very absorbing. But, you know, I, I would say, you know, of, of local interest, I would add two important things, one which is outside this interview, which is now that it's clear that the Russian military are also going to be heavily involved in Azerbaijan itself, Apparently, the troops are being sent, Russian troops are being sent to Nagorno-Karabakh to a great extent through Azerbaijan. This monitoring center that the Turks have been insisting on will be limited to Azerbaijan, and the Russians will be involved in that too. But most importantly, apparently, this talk of a railway line now being opened from Russia through Azerbaijan to provide logistical support to this uh, our peacekeeping force. So Azerbaijan is being you know, pushed into the Russian military sphere, fact which hasn't been widely reported. But for me, the really extraordinary part of this interview that Putin gave, the thing that really made my eyebrows whiz up, were his comments about Turkey. Now, he was, you know, uh, you know, basically challenged directly, you know, doesn't this agreement give Turkey a role in the Caucasus? 
Well, he implicitly blamed Gorbachev and the breakup of the Soviet Union for the fact that Turkey has a role in the Caucasus. He went very far to say that, you know, Azerbaijan is an independent country. It can call on whichever country it pleases for military help. If Azerbaijan wants to call in Turkey, that's its affair. I don't think many Russians will be very happy with that answer. I mean, what if Azerbaijan were to call for help from the United States, for example, and set up a US base? Would Putin be quite as accommodating about that as he is about Turkey. So I don't think a lot of Russians will be happy with that answer. But the really astonishing thing, the thing that, as I said, I, I, I was incredulous about was this long passage in this, uh, uh, um, you know, question and answer in which he talked about Russian-Turkish relations. He said, yes, of course, Russia and Turkey have fought many wars. There've been, there's been much hostility between the two countries. But, you know, uh, France and Germany did the same. And eventually in the 60s, they patched up their quarrel and now they're the best of friends. So why can't we do the same with Turkey? Now, if Putin really thinks that, if he really thinks that he can make a sort of friendship of the kind that de Gaulle and Adenauer did in the 60s between France and Germany, if he thinks he can make that kind of friendship with Erdogan, then frankly, he's delusional. <laughs> I think it's an absolutely deluded idea. And I wonder whether this is some kind of Ida fix he has, the, the, you know, he imagines himself this person who's going to you know achieve this great reconciliation between turkey and russia because it's what he was saying was i mean completely surreal very unlike uh putin generally who's usually very tough-minded and realistic but, but this comment as i said couched in his you know usual cold language uh, just i find it quite bizarre actually i'm not saying that turkey and russia need to be enemies or even adversaries, but to be the kind of partners that France and Germany is, well, that isn't going to happen, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. And if uh, Putin were to understand feeling in Turkey, he would realize that. Isn't Putin worried about jihadists in, uh, in the Caucasus at all? I mean, it, is he not worried about it at all? Because this is the guy that came to power in the late 90s, yeah. early 2000s, with the, you know, the guy that was going to stamp out jihadists from the Caucasus with Chechnya. I mean, that was what what gave him his street creed. You know, that's that's what made Putin Putin. <laughs> Back Absolutely. Then. Absolutely. Is he not worried about about this at all? Absolutely. I mean, he made that famous comment in the very first months before he was even president, when he was, you know, acting prime minister. You know, that if the jihadi terrorists hid in a closet he used a much stronger word than the they you know the, the russian military would come and find them there and he used a much stronger word than that I, about that also i mean it was an extraordinary strong statement he didn't mention them i mean they're hardly there in this in this interview i mean you know, that problem which he did discuss with erdogan over the phone i mean we have the kremlin readouts um, um, it's now sort of disappeared for him. I mean, it's very strange. I mean, it could be that these people have been pulled out. I, I doubt it, actually. Or it could be that he hopes that Azerbaijan, that the uh, Azerbaijanian government will sort them out. But as I said, it was hardly there, hardly mentioned. As I said, instead, we get this strange idea of one day, you know, Russia and Turkey becoming the best of friends. I mean, I, I, I really don't know where he got that idea from, but I mean, it, it isn't going to happen. It's a case of Putin, I'm afraid, being completely unrealistic. Is uh, two questions to, to wrap up this video. Number one, is Putin playing some kind of, everyone says it all the time, is he playing some kind of 4D, 5D chest here by, by dealing with Turkey in such a manner? I don't know, maybe, maybe he's playing some sort of 4 or 5D long game chess that, None of us can can see. Oh, well, I'm, maybe you have some comments there. Num, num, uh, yeah, number two is a lot of people, you know, they – and I've brought this up and some people say, oh, that's just silly, Alex. What are you saying? Putin knows better. Maybe Putin really does believe that he can uh, mm -hmm. move Turkey away from NATO and create yeah. his own yeah. uh, alliance between, Tur between Turkey, Russia – 
China, Iran, create his own little uh, alliance and, and maybe break up NATO by moving Turkey, getting Turkey to switch teams. I mean, when I say that, and when many people say that, because that is a theory that floats around, many people laugh and they say that'll, that'll never happen. And, you know, Putin knows better. He knows that this can't happen. But maybe he does truly believe that he can, you know, convince mm-hmm. Erdogan to to ditch NATO and, and come to to his new, you know, world vision. Yes, well, I mean, you know, first to, to answer your first question, if he really is playing, you know, 5D or 6D chess, then I can't work it out. I mean, I can't figure out the game here at all because uh, uh, this this is, this would be so complicated and so intricate. I don't believe that. I, I really don't think that's part of Putin's agenda at all. I don't think he has this very complicated agenda. This very playing this very complicated chess game that we don't understand. I I can't see how that can be. What I will say, and I, I you know I will repeat this again, and I said this before, and I want to acknowledge it because uh, uh, some people are not you know questioning this. Russia is the big, sh- the very big short term winner here. The Russians are now all over the Caucasus, apart from Georgia, which is now looking like it's becoming encircled. Uh, Azerbaijan is being pulled into Russia's orbit. The Russians are in control of all the main main roads and of all the and of all the rail links. So, in a sense, they've tightened their grip. They have, I think, in the process, annoyed. That's a mild word for how people feel in Armenia about this. And of course, they've also, I think, annoyed more than they're admitting the Azerbaijanians also. But that's something we've discussed on other programs. As to pulling Turkey away from NATO, I think that's exactly what Putin thinks. Why else talk about, you know, this great friendship between Germany and France? He actually talks in this interview about France and Germany being working together in the EU and in NATO as allies and partners. It seems to me that's exactly what he imagines is going to one day happen between Russia and Turkey. Now, maybe Putin does have secret knowledge of which I simply don't know. All I will say is, you know, I and you know, we know a bit about this region. We know a little bit about how Turkey works. Um, I don't believe that is going to happen anytime soon. I don't believe it's going to happen in my lifetime, to put it, to put it in, you know, more straightforwardly than this. I certainly don't believe it's going to happen in any conceivable time scale that Putin imagines. Yes, there have been times when Turkey and Russia have been on reasonably close terms. They were so in the 20s and 30s. They are so, but in a very complicated and tense way between uh, Putin and Erdogan now. But Erdogan is not fully secure. I mean, he's recently had to sack his son-in-law from the finance ministry. There's been reports, there's a long long report in the Financial Times that uh, uh, a Turkish central bank, so far from having reserves, actually owes $50 billion. In other words, it's not got reserves, cash reserves. It's minus reserves. It's in debt. Uh, So, you know, the Turkish economy is in a very precarious state. Um, It may be that Erdogan is not very going to be there for very long. Much more likely, if he falls, that we will see much more conventionally minded, Western minded, pro-Europe, pro-NATO, pro-US people coming to power in Turkey. And, you know, is Erdogan somebody you can trust anyway? So, I, you know, I, I, I think that Putin obviously may have information which we don't have, but if it is, he does have it, it is clearly so secret and so you know mysterious that it's absolutely not apparent to us, not, notwithstanding that this is our region, and we know and we know our region, I think you and I pretty well. And I have to say it frankly, I think that information is wrong. So yes. He does have this uh, ambition. I think it is a completely unrealistic one. Yeah, I agree with you there. Finally, Alexander, real quick, where does uh, Armenia go? You mentioned that Georgia appears mm-hmm. surrounded. Armenia also appears that, that it's surrounded yeah. now and doesn't really have anywhere to turn other than um, at the mercy of Russia. 
Yeah. I mean, it's it, the, the U.S., the Armenian diaspora in the U.S., I mean, they lobbied hard, but at the end of the day, the U.S. tried to broker a deal. They, yeah. they got a little bit a little bit done, but they couldn't really get all the way. Yeah. France seemed like it was more of a no-show. <laughs> at the end of the day, where does Armenia turn? Because it, it when you look at it, it does look like it's surrounded on all, on all parts now. It, it, it is surrounded. It is completely dependent now on Russia's goodwill. So, I mean, that is, that is something that has happened to Armenia. I will say Putin did go out of his way to be sympathetic to Armenia in this interview. He spoke, in fact, about, you know, the um, massacre in Sumgay. It is the true start, the true beginning of the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh crisis. He made it very clear that was where it all began. So that, you know, the, the massacre of Armenians in Azerbaijan which took place in, I think, 1988. He also talks about, um, he also talks about, you know, the, the genocide. I mean, he's never, he's never balked from talking about that. So he's sympathetic to Armenia, but he is sympathetic in a, from a position of almost overwhelming geopolitical strength because Armenia is now in effect at his mercy. He even said at one point that if the Armenians pull out of this agreement, the word he used was that it would be suicidal for them. Well, you know, that's that's both, uh, that's a warning, it's also a threat, if you like. Azerbaijan is now, as I said, I think going to start slipping gradually into Moscow's orbit. The Turks have not been able to achieve as much there as I think they expected. And as I said, Georgia does look encircled. So he is the big short-term winner. He's played the usual chess game very skillfully, or if you like, the usual card game. He's played his cards very skillfully. He's got Russian troops into the Southern Caucasus in a scale that has never, they haven't been there since the uh, Soviet Union broke up. And he's now got, you know, an air and rail bridge coming through Azerbaijan. So this is a, in that respect, he's in a very strong position. Uh, it's just the durability of this, which I question. And what Georgia does, well, we shall have to wait and see. Uh, bear in mind that Georgia gets its energy supplies from Azerbaijan and from Iran, and both Azerbaijan and Iran are now starting to tilt increasingly towards Russia. So Georgia may be in for a hard time, but, you know, you can be the short-term victor, but at the price of long-term trouble. And I have a sense here that he's been, the, that Putin has managed, maneuvered himself to be the short-term victor, but that he's storing up for himself, or perhaps not for himself, but for his successors, a pile of trouble. Hmm. All right, we will leave it there. Alexander Barkers, thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below. Hit that like, hit that share. Share this video with everybody that you know. That helps us out a lot. Also, check us out on BitChute, on Odyssey, and on Rumble as well. You'll find all those links in the description box down below. Donate to us on PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar, and with Bitcoin as well. You'll also find those links in the description box down below, and your donation really helps this channel out, as well as going to the Duran shop. That also helps this channel out a lot. And I think Alexander has some new merch as well. Well, I do, absolutely. I've got you. People will notice that I'm wearing a fantastic new uh, sweatshirt, a Duran sweatshirt. And you can see there it's the flag of Scotland. So Scotland is another uh, uh, core kingdom of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. And uh, England and Scotland are the two kingdoms that make up the United Kingdom. How long it will stay united, we shall see. But regardless of that, Scotland is a great nation, wonderful history, uh, um, amazing landscape. It's quite extraordinary. If you go to Scotland, go to the far north of Scotland, it's almost Arctic. It's just uh, 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 astonishingly amazing. And with, uh, with you know, castles and forests and tundra and, um, you know, beautiful last night, one of the most striking in Europe. And of course, tremendous culture, tremendous history, um, and, uh, you know, literature, music, whatever. The Scots are one of the most creative of the, of the people. And so I'm very delighted to be wearing a marvellous, enormously comfortable, exceptionally warm, beautifully made, embroidered, 
you, you can see that the embroidery there is beautifully embroidered, uh, uh, Duran sweatshirt with the flag of Scotland. And can I just say, of course, it adds to that wonderful collection of uh, uh, shirts, um, polo shirts, uh, you know, um, hoodies, and of course, now we have sweatshirts too. And let's not forget our amazing hats. And I've also got a hat, a new kind of hat, different from the others, but you can see it doesn't look very easy to put on because I've got my headphones, but there it is with the tricolor of France. And by the way, last night I was watching to, in, to our viewers in France, a very moving documentary about the fire in Notre Dame. And I was seeing, you know, the French firefighters fighting the fire. I hadn't realized how, what a tremendous challenge it was and the courage of those people astonished me. So I'm proud to be wearing a hat with the flag of France, the tricolor of France, a country I love, a country where I used to live, and a country whose culture I greatly revere. So you can buy all of these wonderful things in the Duran uh, in our shop. You can support us by coming to our shop. You can support us also by finding us on our various other platforms, on BitChute, on, uh, um, on Library, on Odyssey, and on Rumble, where we're growing you know, exponentially. You can also support us by coming to Patreon and Subscribestar. And of course, you can support us by coming to our shop, and you will be thrilled when you buy the wonderful things that are there on our shop. So unless Alex has something else to add, which he may do, please come and join us uh, in our next uh, program. I'll just remind everybody to also look for our special edition uh, merchandise items from artist Dimitri Ikonomo. These are special editions created just for the Duran. We've got a few countries that he's created designs for, T-shirts, mugs, long sleeve, and some other merchandise. Behind me is one of his, another one of his paintings. Up top, it actually has the right, the words, the art of self-sabotage. I don't know, let me see if I could just tilt the camera right there. So there you see the whole painting right there, but he's, de he's designed special shirts for the Duran. So uh, check that out as well. I'll put a link in the description box down below. Alexander Berkuris, take care. <laughs>